Welcome to the Power of Partnership podcast. I'm Rianne Eisler, president of the Center for Partnership Systems. This podcast brings you voices from the partnership movement, people using partnership practices to build a world that values caring, nature, and shared prosperity. The Power of Partnership podcast is hosted by Cherry Jacobs Pruitt, a health policy and partnership scholar. Today, Cherry interviews award-winning journalist and writer Ricky Gard Diamond on money, politics, and partnership-based cultural change. Now on to the POP podcast, showing how we can create an economic system and structure that values caring for each other and the planet. Welcome, Ricky, and thank you so much for joining us for the Power of Partnership podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. As you know, Rian describes economics as being one of the four cornerstones that's really critical in how every society is formed. So, you know, economics, along with childhood and family relations, the way we look at gender, issues of gender, and then, of course, the narratives and stories that are inherent within a society so why do you think that lack of accessibility related to economics exists? Well, I think I'm a, I'm a good um, example. My radical education in economics began as a single mother with uh, three kids. I was also going to school. I don't know how I did it all, but um, a lot of women do, and I was doing it. And yet I couldn't make my budget work. And here I had an extra check. I was working full time. I had an extra check of child support of uh, $25 a week for my three kids. And uh, I couldn't make my budget work. And I thought there was something wrong with me. And I was so ashamed when I had to go to the welfare office um, to try to get some government help. And I did get government help. But I also met uh, other women there who were um, mostly women of color who were I could see in in uh, you know worse shape than I was, and yet that inspired me to go into the war on poverty. I became um, an editor of a statewide paper here, um, covering all kinds of government policy issues and uh, related to poverty. And yet, if you had asked me about uh, economic issues, if you had used that word, the economy. I wouldn't have been able to speak about it. I never saw the connection between my own story and that larger story that um, mostly gets reported in terms of what Wall Street says is happening. I never connected the two. And I think that's true for so many people um, because that conversation has been dominated very much by a particular class of a particular gender of a particular race, um, which has dominated that uh, realm of money and for a long time. So um, they're not, uh, Wall Street continues to be a place that um, is not open to, terribly open to uh, to women and to people of color. It's purpose, the overall um, strategy for their narrative is winning. Winning requires a good many losers, and that's exactly what we see happening with growing inequality in our in our country. And can you talk about how the story of the economy translates into our politics? I guess I began to think about this when I uh, when I saw the Nobel lecture of Milton Friedman. All of a sudden. Uh, what had been called voodoo economics by uh, the first George Bush uh, was suddenly Reaganomics and was, you know, very, very popular in a call. And, you know, all of a sudden, this free market economy was 
uh, the only choice you had. And I wondered how that came about. And I noticed that Milton Friedman, who was um, Reaganomics' uh, most favorite economist from the Chicago School, who had just gotten the Nobel Prize, presented economics as if it were a force of nature, as if it were physics, and wanted to um, remove any kind of um, humane qualities other than it was numbers and graphs and and physics and just uh, a matter of momentum and force rather than of humans making certain decisions that um, disqualified some people and and made others winners. When I saw that, I wondered, why did he do that? Why? Because the previous economists were Keynesian economists uh, and were more humane. Mr. Keynes decided that if there was a conflict between renters and landlords, that it was better for the government to favor the renters because they were the real engine of the productive economy. And all of that was reversed when the free marketers came into power. So I wonder why was that? Why did they kind of put themselves up on a pedestal like that and exalt themselves to the to the you know being a force of nature and not accountable to anyone? And um, I had learned that there was a lot of action happening at the. Chicago School, the University of Chicago, having to do with um, women's saying, wait a minute, all the books you're showing us, all of the stories you're telling us have been created by a particular class of a particular gender of a particular race. And maybe there are, are you know, wider um, realms that we could be looking at. And so I think it was kind of a reaction to people demanding in the uh in in the 60s and 70s demanding uh some some answers some accountability from their government and uh so physics came out of the closet and um became economic what is working what are what are you seeing in terms of models of an economic system that um is truly partnership based yeah, I'll, I'll point to some other uh, women authors that I know of who are talking about some of these big changes. Uh, Marjorie Kelly and talking about cooperative worker ownership. Uh, Georgia Kelly talking about taking seminars at Mondragon, which is a cooperative corporation that is an umbrella for something like 93 cooperatives that when the 2008 crash happened, did not lay off all kinds of workers because they were the owners and they were involved in making their own decisions. And so um, they survived the crash uh, without all the human misery that we experienced here in the United States. Um, I can talk about uh, Ellen Brown and her work in exposing the nature of currency as a, as a creation of debt and uh, public banking and public money being another alternative that is more um, partnership-based than um, an exchange-based rather than um, debt-based. So talking about uh, new ways of doing business and new ways of thinking about currency and debt, new ways of thinking about um caring for the environment and making that part of the measurements. I mean, Rianne's work with Nancy Fulbright at UMass, the Social Wealth Economic Indicators, which um, also measures uh, the caring of community and the caring in the environment that happens all around us and including that, and also showing how Caring about those things, including that in your measurements, also uh, revealed the good outcome that comes from that caring. You actually have uh, healthier economic results when you invest in those things. 
I I just did an interview uh, with a woman named uh, Janine Furpo, who, along with another woman named Ellen Rimmer, has an organization called Invest for Better. And because uh, women often um, often have money, inherit money, have generational wealth, um, and yet they hand it over to other money managers. Um, Janine is encouraging women. Janine and Ellen are encouraging women to um, to study up and to become familiar. And they've even created um, what they call uh, investment learning circles for women to kind of create peer learning circles to uh, educate one another where we learn well that way. And um, really talking about uh, something called ESG. ESG uh, investments are environmental. People look at the um, environmental policies of a company, the um, sustainability of that company and its context, the effect that it has on the communities they um, serve, and um, the manner in which they govern their organization. And uh, this is um, then she calls it values aligned investing. Uh, There are more people talking about this now. And in fact, it's become something of a political hot button issue because there are those oil and gas industries that see this as very, very dangerous and um, so you'll hear a lot about something called woke capitalism, which uh, Texas and uh, Florida have actually legislated against so that pension plans in Texas are not allowed to invest in these ESG approved kinds of um, funds, which is interesting to think about. So. It's a really um, important movement, and it has its limits. Investment has its limits, but um, it could make a huge difference in what sorts of companies uh, are deemed uh, reliable for investments and where we want our economy to go. You are listening to the Power of Partnership podcast. If you would like us to share your partnership story, Or if you would like to become a proud sponsor of the POP podcast, please contact us at center at partnershipway.org. And now back to today's episode. Ricky, are there any models that we're seeing from other countries around shifting economics to value well-being of their nations? Yes. Um, in fact, I, there are many, um, and uh, New Zealand being one, Canada being another, France uh, having new measures that, that look at the value of uh, the social wealth that uh, we create with caring. And uh, you, I have to also credit um, the um, wonderful economist from New Zealand, Marilyn Waring, who talked about this with her book, um, uh, If Women Counted, which kind of brought up that whole subject. Uh, She became a New Zealand parliamentarian when um, when she was just a young musician starting out, one of the first women to be elected to parliament, and learned about how budgets were done and how the GDP was done. And she said, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and they said, oh, well, we know it is kind of goofy, but um, it's the way it's always been done. Nobody was questioning it. Um, but she did a great job of doing that and actually bringing it to the public conversation. What Canada has been doing, which uh, the first step in any of this is um, measuring what isn't now measured. And then, uh, you know, you've got more pieces to the puzzle to put together and to connect and uh, see various trends, which is the value of these new measurements. Some experiments, for instance, being done with grants that come to families, which was an experiment in Canada. And then looking at what effect did it have on the families? Did they stop going to work? Did they, how did they do when they went to school? 
Um, and then connecting those dots and seeing that, well, having some, uh, what do I want to say, some regularity, some uh, relaxation of uh, financial terror <laughs> with a, a reliable income is actually a helpful thing. And you can see it when you look at the school grades, when you look at the work participation, when you look at education levels being raised as a result of this, you can see the good outcomes. Um, that isn't possible unless you measure it. And I have to say that the United States has been particularly successful in resisting that effort. Uh, it, it just has never happened here, and uh, it needs to. There is an International Association of Feminist Economists um, that I just met in South Africa that Nancy Fulbray was actually part of founding and um, gaining more um, more influence. Although I have to say that um, in my latest column, I, I noted that um, we talk about STEM education, which is science, uh, technology, uh, engineering and math, male-dominated fields that, that women have made a concerted effort to uh, enter. And I said that really it should be STEAM, not STEM. Economics should be that second E in there with, because, in fact, women are making more inroads in engineering than they are in economics. And uh, so even though more women economists are being listened to. Um, we have a need for more younger millennial economists who are taking a new look at the economy and helping us to change the story to one that wages life. Let's start talking a bit about your work directly, specifically an economy of our own and the other coalition building work you're doing and writings on economic issues. Yeah, yes. Um, well, when I uh, wrote Screwnomics, um, I proposed a column to um, Ms. Magazine, and I now have a series at Ms. Magazine called Women Unscrewing Screwnomics. Now, Screwnomics was my name for something I saw all around me that uh, never seemed to be said out loud but it's the economic theory that women should always work for less or even better for free, right? So I named it Screwnomics, which my mother would not have been very pleased by that name. But that is a, an expression that you hear people use. Well, I've just been screwed. Well, when you look at the as a person interested in language, which is me very much, um, it's not a pleasant allegory at all. What it's saying is to be female is to be less than and to be taken, to be used, whether you give permission or not. And that is not pleasant. And in fact, it's traumatic for women to to think about. I should give a trigger warning when I oh, we'll talk about this. But the wonderful thing about language is that by changing it to women unscrewing screwnomics, all of a sudden you see carpenters at work, right? Building things. And I think that is what women are doing. They're transforming what has been a disadvantage into an advantage because women's values tend to be aligned with collaboration, with networking, with connection. So uh, Schoonomics, my book, was really encouraging women to talk to other women about their own economic story, which is often traumatic, often very difficult. There's a lot of shame connected to talking about money. And um, yet, if we begin to do that, we learn we're not alone. We're not alone. There are more of us uh, who are debtors than those who are um money landlords, let's call them. And um and and women together can co-create wonderful new solutions, which 
is part of what an economy of our own is about. It's an organization, a coalition, which is based on uh, Virginia Woolf's uh, famous essay about what a woman needs. She needs two things, Virginia Woolf said. She wrote this in 1920. She needs an income and she needs a room of her own. And an economy of our own changes the pronoun because uh, when women are in a room of her own and talking about things, they always are more inclusive, and we are too. So an economy of our own is about an economy that serves all of us better. And um, it engages women. It gives women a safe place to talk together about economic issues. Rianne has been... Um, a, a wonderful conversationalist in a couple of our Zooms of our own, we call them. But Rianne has talked about um, what we call the invisible woman, the woman who just doesn't show up anywhere in the GDP. None of our caring shows up anywhere in the GDP. And uh, also in creating a, a safe digital world that in, is more inclusive for all of us. Um, so we, we have um, about a dozen Zooms of our own conversations, and each of those conversations has an accompanying um, for further learning uh, resource, and um, they're they're all free because we we want to make uh, all of our information uh, freely available. We have a survey on our website, and we'd love to know what women say they most want to learn about um, because you know we've kind of got. Uh, two things on our agenda. On the one hand, we want women to know how to do well in the economy that we have. How can you survive in this present economy? How can you thrive in this present economy? And uh, But also, how can we transform this economy so that it isn't traumatic for so many, so that it isn't so unequal, and so that our environment is not destroyed um, and our families are not torn apart by economic issues and political issues that um, the the whole phenomenon of scarcity, too little for too many, is um, puts all of us at odds with one another. That's that's the way it operates. We don't have to operate that way. Wonderful. And as we move, hopefully, towards a more partnership-oriented society related to gender, and we start seeing more single-headed households by men or by non-binary individuals, I assume all of those resources are going to be just as valuable for them as well as for women. Is that fair? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and they are often the sources of the most exciting ideas because... Um, they see the economy much more fully than um, than do Wall Street traders who only see a small portion and they're only thinking about a narrow realm of ideas. But um, but people in the communities that have been the most marginalized, those are the ones who probably know more than anybody. They have to pay attention, right, to survive. So, Ricky, thank you again so much for sharing all your wonderful words of wisdom and resources with us. I wonder if you have any closing remarks that you'd like to share with our listeners about how to create an economy that I love the way you put it, an economy that's waged as life, not as war. So a lot of the way this economy, current economy we're living with is waged as war, winning, being victors. Um, being money kings, if possible, right? Um, so how do we wage life? And I think that we're only just now beginning to think about that. So I think it's an ongoing conversation that we're just going to have to keep on talking and talking and talking about and having brilliant ideas about. I mean, um, you know, the the idea of um, cooperative money, for instance, is often uh, accredited to the um, English weavers who created the co-op movement that, that we all know. But in fact, um, there are organizations that 
African women call SUSUs, for instance, mutual aid organizations, which are very casual, which are part of the informal economy that is dismissed by so many. Um, it's been around for a long time. Um, so I, I think that going back to look at uh, ways people have thrived in civilizations outside of European and North American uh, civilizations is really an important part of that research of how you wage life, how you make life um, possible and enable it to thrive happily. Wouldn't that be lovely? Thank you so much again, Ricky, for being with us today. It's really been a pleasure interviewing you. And for our listeners, you can find links to all of the resources we've talked about during today's interview, as well as a link to Rian's Real Wealth of Nations book that was published in 2007, as well as a link to the Center for Partnership Systems, where you can find courses and resources to help you dig deeper into an understanding of Rian's Domination Partnership Continuum and the four cornerstones of childhood and family relations, gender, narratives and stories, and of course, economics. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure all the way. Thank you for listening to the Power of Partnership podcast. We're grateful to Rising Appalachia for the use of resilience as our Power of Partnership theme music. If you would like us to feature your partnership story, or if you would like to be a proud sponsor of the Power of Partnership podcast, please contact us at center at partnershipway.org. We hope you enjoyed this episode and will leave us a review on your favorite podcast channel. And don't forget to subscribe to be notified when new episodes are released. I'm Cherry Jacobs Pruitt. See you next time on the Power of Partnership podcast. I am Trust the movement, I negate the chaos, uplift the negative, I'll show up at the table again and again and again, I'll close my mouth and learn to live.